In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear saints, all of the worship and the ceremony and the regulations of the Old Testament may be summed up with one phrase from Leviticus. You shall distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. And the entire tabernacle, with all its laws and its rules, all of the regulations, all of the ritual, all of it was for this purpose, to distinguish the common from the holy, to distinguish the clean from the unclean, so that God could dwell with his people. God himself, of course, is holy. God is holy in a way that nothing else is, nothing else in this world. It was God who thundered from Mount Sinai and rained down fire and hail. God who delivered his people by great judgments out of Egypt. God, who the scripture tells us is a consuming fire. This holy God came down from the mountain to live in the tabernacle and live amongst his people. The people were not clean. They were not holy, not like God is. That's the whole problem. You see, holiness in God is like a fire. And if you thrust a rod of iron into the fire, it'll get hot, it'll glow with the flame's light, but it won't be destroyed. But if you throw grass and stubble and straw into the fire, it is consumed, it's destroyed, it's burned up. So it is with God. What is clean may come into God's presence. Like Adam, Adam walked with God before the fall, and yet since the fall now, no one is clean. No one is pure. All have become corrupted with death, with corruption, with decay. And any uncleanness that enters into the presence of God in all his holiness is destroyed. That's what we see happening in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle. Ask Nadab and Abihu, who offered their own unauthorized fire as an offering before the Lord, and they were consumed by God's holy fire. Ask Uzzah who set his hand out upon the ark of God and was struck down in a moment. God is holy, and the people are not, not in themselves. So God, in his mercy, established all the rules of the Old Testament, and the tabernacle, the priesthood, the barriers, all of the rituals and the sacrifices. The priests had to keep themselves clean and separate from what was unclean, so that they could come into God's presence and serve the people. The sacrifices had to be kept pure and clean in a holy place and kept from anything unclean so that those sacrifices could be the instrument by which God gives his own holiness to the people. And the people themselves of Israel had to keep themselves separate. They had to distinguish themselves from the pagan nations around them and all of their false doctrines and false idols and false worship. All of these rules and regulations, they existed to protect God's people to keep those who are unclean from being destroyed before the holy God who loves them and wants to purify them. And all of these rules and regulations provided a way for God's people to be purified, to receive of God's own holiness, and to come into contact with him. God's people, then, were to be holy even as God is holy. And yet all of this is simply a shadow of something greater, something that was still to come. Now, many things could make one unclean under those Old Testament laws. And if you were unclean then, you were prevented from coming into the temple. You were prevented from coming into God's presence for your own protection and for the protection of the people, that you did not defile the holy place with your corruption. And most of the reasons that one might be unclean had to do with death, decay, corruption, certain kinds of food, certain kinds of mold, coming into contact with a dead body, all of these sorts of things. And of all of them, one of the most fearsome was leprosy. Leprosy made one unclean. Now, lots of things made one unclean, and they were all uh, contagious in the sense that if you touched one or touched something that was unclean, you became unclean, and so it could spread through the people. Uh, leprosy was like this also, but there was something more fearsome about leprosy. The disease itself was contagious. If you had the disease, uh, the disease upon your flesh and your skin then you were unclean so long as you had it. And worst of all, even to the time of Christ and the time of the New Testament, there was no cure. No one knew how to stop leprosy. So in Jesus' day, we find these ten lepers out in the wilderness, 
outside the towns. They had to keep themselves separate from the people. No one wanted to catch this horrible disease that not only would slowly destroy their flesh and kill them, but it would cut them off from the temple. It would cut them off from God and his holy presence. So they had to keep separate, stay outside the towns, out on the edge of society. Their loved ones, if they had any who were willing, would come out and leave food for them at a place where they could walk away and not get close to the lepers. And the lepers, as the law in Leviticus taught, had to go about and uh, stay away from everyone and shout out to them, unclean, unclean, to warn everyone away from them. And they were totally cut off then from God's presence in the temple, from the life and the salvation that he gave to them through those means. In our text today, something amazing happened. God, in all of his holy, saving, life-giving presence, goes out to them. He's not hiding in the temple, waiting for someone to be pure enough to come in, to come into his presence, to receive his holiness. God goes out to them in the very flesh of Jesus Christ, your Lord, your Savior. No one may see me and live. That's what God said in the Old Testament. Even the seraphim in all of their glory and the angels cover their eyes and hide their face from the presence of God. But now these ten lepers look with their own eyes upon the face of God in Jesus Christ. And the very one who burned and thundered from Mount Sinai now comes and speaks to them with a gentle voice, bringing to them healing and life and forgiveness. And that God who dwelt in the tabernacle where no unclean thing could enter, where only the priests could come, even only the high priest, and that but once a year into the Holy of Holies, now that same God who dwelt in that Holy of Holies walked among them, walked around in Galilee and Samaria, the land of the unclean nations and the pagans. The rabbis at Jesus' time thought that Galilee itself and Samaria were unclean. Just to walk around in the dust of that place was to make yourself unclean unclean and unable to enter into the temple. The holy God in all of his purity set foot on that dust and walked through that uh, neighborhood, through that town, walked through those streets and brought life and cleansing and salvation to those lepers. Now, if these 10 lepers had thought through all of the Old Testament and all of its description and language and teaching about who God is and his holiness, they might well have run screaming. They might well have run away fled from such a holy God. But Jesus, we see, has no such qualms. He has no such fears to preserve his own holiness and his own purity. He goes out, as we hear through the rest of the Gospels, touching the dead and raising them to life, sticking out his hand to touch those who are unclean, healing the sick with his voice, forgiving sins, purifying souls, and not one of them was destroyed and struck down like Nadab and Abihu or like Uzzah in the ark. Not one of those sick, poor souls that Jesus cleansed was struck down and destroyed by his holiness. They were cleansed by it. This is why the Son of God took on flesh. The Son of God, in all of his holiness, took on to himself human flesh, not to destroy humanity, but to unite it to himself, to preserve it, to save it, to redeem it. He took on a human body exactly like us, except without sin. And in that body, which is just like yours, yet without sin, the very holiness of God shone, like on the Mount of Transfiguration. The very fullness of the deity, in all his holiness, in all his purity, in all his righteousness, dwelt in flesh just like yours. That's what Jesus came to do, to save and to redeem. To touch the God of Sinai on the mountain with all his raw, burning, thundering power, even to look at him, meant destruction. But now he has taken up a human body specifically so that he can be touched and handled. And so that us sinners can come into contact with him and not be destroyed. He came to redeem you from your sin. To purify you, to transform you, to glorify you until you too may shine with the light of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Until you at last may shine with pure glory in your resurrected body someday. So it was then for these ten lepers. They lived out in the wilderness in their filth, in their uncleanness, in their corruption and decay, and they see the Lord of heaven and earth coming towards them, and they call out, Lord, have mercy. And in all their miserable uncleanness, Jesus comes with his holy purity, and he cleanses them. He cleanses them, and he takes upon himself all of the uncleanness, all of the sin, all of the corruption of this world. It's one thing for him to come into the world, 
to spread his own purity and holiness among sinful men. It's another thing that he takes on our diseases, our illnesses, and he takes them to the cross. Jesus was taken outside the camp like a leper, like someone unclean. He was taken up to the cross and put to death. And in his holy flesh was put to death all of your corruption, all of your uncleanness, all of your sin. Thanks be to God. Now when Jesus heals these ten lepers, he sends them ahead of himself to the temple. You remember, of course, that our Lord is making his way to Jerusalem, bit by bit. He's been teaching his disciples all the way. And he sends the lepers on ahead of him to the temple. He says, go show yourselves to the priests. In Leviticus, there is law put in place by God through Moses that one who was cleansed of a disease of the flesh, like leprosy, if ever that were the case, was to come before the priests, to be inspected by them, to be declared clean, and to offer sacrifice. There is a elaborate ritual in which uh, a bird and hyssop and um, uh, cedar wood had to be dipped into blood and sprinkled upon him, uh, and all of this ritual had to be performed in order to declare him clean, in order to make sacrifice to God, and all of it then culminated with the offering of a lamb, a guilt offering, uh, the lamb burnt up on the altar to atone for sin and to give thanks to God. So then the ten went to the temple. That's what Jesus told them to do. So how is it Jesus asks, where are the nine? The one turns and comes back. Why is Jesus even raising the question, where are the nine? Well, Jesus, they're where you told them to go, into the temple. They're offering the sacrifice. They're giving glory and thanks to God. One turned back. You see, one man was different. The other nine could go to the temple, be declared clean by the priest, offer the sacrifice, and go on and live their lives as new men, cleansed, restored, whole. One was a Samaritan. And the Samaritan, even after being cleansed by our Lord with all of his holy power, cleansed of his disease miraculously, still he was unclean. He was not permitted into the temple. He was not permitted because he was a Samaritan. The Samaritans were a mixed people. That's what the people at the time of Jesus would have thought, the Pharisees and the rabbis. The Samaritans were a mixed people, a mixture of unfaithful Israel in the north with all of their pagan neighbors and all of their uh, idolatrous tribes of that land. So the Samaritans had false doctrine. They had false worship. They worshipped on Mount Gerizim with their own temple. And so they were considered unclean. They were a mixture of the holy and the unholy, of the clean and the common. So they were not allowed into the temple. So where is this one Samaritan to go? When Jesus says, go show yourselves to the priest, he's not allowed in the temple in Jerusalem. They wouldn't have put him in or let him go in. He can't go to the Samaritan temple because the Samaritan temple was destroyed by the Israelites a hundred years previous. There is no temple in Samaria anymore. Where is this poor Samaritan leper to go? Well, he turns back. He comes to Christ. He comes and falls before his feet and gives glory to God right there at Jesus' own flesh. Indeed, this Samaritan went to the temple. This Samaritan went to the high priest. This Samaritan went to offer sacrifice. Jesus himself is the temple, as John tells us, in his own flesh. His own body is the dwelling place of God on this earth. And so the Samaritan came to the real temple. And he came to the real priest. Jesus himself is the one who offers a sacrifice who offers one offering once and for all upon the cross to cleanse all people. This Samaritan received that cleansing before it even happened. This Samaritan received the cleansing of the cross before the offering was made, and yet, nonetheless, he received that cleansing. The one sanctification, the one cleansing wrought by the cross for you and for him and for all people of all time. And he came to Jesus, who himself was that sacrifice, the Lamb, as it was under the rules of Leviticus, under the law, the lepers would have had to go and offer a sacrifice, finally with a lamb, a guilt offering. There is one guilt offering, and the Samaritan was right there at his feet. Jesus himself, the one offered for all of your sin, the one offered for all of his sin, and the one who took all of his uncleanness on himself and put it to death in his body on the cross. So then, the Samaritan offers a true sacrifice. He offers a true sacrifice in the true temple with the true priest. And dear saints, this is true even for you today. 
Do not think that all of this business about clean and unclean is some Old Testament, old-fashioned, out-of-date stuff for Moses. There is still clean and unclean among you. It's still a reality in the world, even in your own heart. Consider what our Lord says. It is not what goes into the mouth, not what you eat, but it's what comes out of a person that defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The unclean is still in this world. It's all around you in the culture today. It's even in your own heart. And yet, our Lord tells us that we have been washed, that you, dear saints, have been sanctified, that you have been cleansed once for all by the offering for all times on the cross, and indeed you received it in your holy baptism. He received it when you were washed. You were washed in Christ himself, united to him, united to his death and resurrection. You have been cleansed. So now you are the holy people. You are made clean even as these lepers were made clean. And you yourselves now may also return to Christ and offer to him the true sacrifice. When you come into this very place where God comes to you, where Christ comes to you in his word and sacrament, you are coming to the true temple, to his own body. And you are coming before him and offering the true sacrifice, even as that leper did, the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. That is the service, that is the worship which Christians offer to God now today. Dear saints, you have become holy. You have become clean. You have been washed and sanctified. The Holy Spirit dwells in you, has his own temple. You are holy. You are the holy people. We're told that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus our Lord, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, through the dividing wall, access to God, through his own flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of our faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed by pure water. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.